We're so glad you're here today. I'd like to echo what Mike said at the beginning of our service. Welcome to all of you who are physically present in our building, as well as to all of you who are watching online today. There is coming a day in which God will place the final period on the final sentence, in the final paragraph, on the final page, in the final chapter of the volume of human history. There is coming a day when the clock will tick the final second. There is coming a day in which humanity will breathe its last breath upon the earth as we know it. What does Jesus say about the day of judgment? You know, there's a passage in Hebrews 9 verse 27 that I think should be of interest to every individual regardless whether you're young or old or somewhere in between. And that is the passage that says, it is appointed unto man once to die and after this the judgment. I read the story of a man by the name of Bert Olney, O-L-N-E-Y. Bert lived in a small town and he was an atheist. Not only was he an atheist, he was an antagonist. He loved to antagonize Christians. He ridiculed the Bible. He loved to scoff at preachers and call them fakes and phonies. Well, old Bert heard that there was a new preacher in town and he couldn't wait to sink his claws into him. One day he saw him on Main Street and he thought, I'm going to teach this young man a lesson right here and right now. So he walked up to the young man on the sidewalk and he said, I understand you're the new preacher in town. Well, I want you to know that I don't believe a moment of that foolishness. The young man looked at him and said, Sir, it is appointed unto man once to die and after this the judgment. Old Bert said, Well, I want you to know that I think you're a phony. Your church is nothing but a bunch of hypocrites and I don't want to have a thing to do with it, and I don't believe any of it. And the young preacher said, Sir, it's appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. Bert said, Is that all you've got to say? Are you not even willing to argue with me? Are you not even willing to uh, provide me with a rebuke? And the young man said, Sir, it's appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. Old Bert got so mad and so red-faced, he stumped off, went all the way home, and for days he fumed over the fact that this young preacher had not even been willing to take him on in a public debate. But every time he stewed about that young preacher, he was reminded of those words, Sir, it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. And those words began to haunt him. And they begin to work on his heart and work on his mind and his soul. And eventually Bert only changed his life and turned to God. Given the importance of this day, how imperative it is that we ask the question, what does Jesus say about the day of judgment? I have four things I want you to understand that Jesus talks about this morning with regard to the day of judgment. And the first is that Jesus assures us of the surety of judgment. Jesus spoke frequently about the approaching judgment day. Yes, Jesus, the one who spoke of loving one another, the one who spoke of following him and laying our burdens at his feet, Jesus said there is coming a day in which all will be judged. Look at a few passages with me for just a moment. 
In Matthew 10, verses 14 through 16, as Jesus sent his disciples out, he said, whoever does not receive you or does not hear your word, as you leave that house or that city, shake the dust off of your feet. Truly I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Let's go one more chapter. Matthew 11, verses 21 and 22. To the unrepentant cities of his day, Jesus said, Woe to you, Chorazon! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty deeds that have been done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, it will be more tolerable in the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. Let's go one more chapter. Matthew chapter 12, verse 41. Jesus said, And the men of Nineveh will rise up on the day of judgment against this generation, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, one greater than Jonah is here. And then in the very next verse, and the queen of the south will rise up in the day of judgment against this generation, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, I tell you, one greater than Solomon is here. I'd like to go back and look at a passage of Scripture with you. I meant to actually refer to this at the very beginning, but this is as good a time as any. In the book of Revelation, chapter 20, verses 11 through 15, John describes the vision that he had of that final judgment. And I want you to pay close attention to these words. John said, And I looked and saw a great white throne, and him who sat upon it, whose, from whose presence the earth and the heavens fled, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great, and the small standing before the throne, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which was the Lamb's book of life. And the dead were judged according to what was written in the books, according to their deeds. And the sea gave up its dead, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and everyone was judged according to their works. And death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire, and everyone whose name was not found in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Now folks, that's serious business right there. Jesus spoke about the surety of judgment. He said that you have a date of, of destiny with a divine uh, Lord. You have a, a, a rendezvous with righteousness. Now, there are a number of trials that are mentioned throughout the Bible. You might think about the time that a man named Naboth was on trial against the slanderous accusations which had been placed upon him initially by wicked Queen Jezebel back in 1 Kings chapter 21. Or you might think about the trial that the Apostle Paul underwent before the Roman officials of Felix and Festus and later King Agrippa in Acts chapters 24 through 26. You might even think about the trial of Jesus before the Jewish uh, authorities and then later before the Roman authorities, including Pilate, the Roman governor. Back in 1518, a young 37-year-old man stood on trial before the highest religious and political figures of his day. He was on trial and was being urged to recant and renounce the criticisms that he had made of Roman Catholicism and particularly of the Pope. But on that occasion, Martin Luther refused to recant. He stood his ground. I'm telling you this morning, as sure as I'm standing, 
before you, there is coming a day in which all of us will appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We will give an account for how we have lived our lives. We will either hear Jesus say, according to Matthew 25, verse 21, well done, good and faithful servant, or we will hear him say, depart from me, I never knew you. Matthew 7, verse 23. Well, what about the source of judgment? Who's going to be present on that day? What's that day going to be like? Well, let's go back for just a moment to Revelation 20. Notice what John said he saw. John said he saw the great white throne. Now, the greatness of it indicates a deity. The whiteness of it indicates holiness or purity. The nature of it indicates authority. And notice this. Upon it sat one whose presence was so brilliant that even the earth and the heavens fled from it. Who is that? Who is that? Who is sitting upon that throne? Someone says, well, I guess that's God the Father. No, it's not God the Father. It's Jesus. Look at John chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. Jesus said, for the Father judges no one, but he has appointed all judgment to the Son. On that day, you and I are going to be standing face to face with Jesus. He will either be our judge or our savior. He will either be the one recalling those deeds that were written in the books, or he will be the one extending his loving mercy to us because we have named him Lord in this life. What's going to happen on that day? Well, notice what John says. I saw the dead, the great, and the small standing before the throne, the kings of earth as well as the peasants, the famous, the rich, as well as the poor and the humble, the notorious, as well as the anonymous. I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. You and I will stand before that throne one day, my friends. Notice, if you will, the standard of judgment. Human judgment is so often mistaken because it is subjective it's subject to feelings to error but not divine judgment God's judgment is objective because it is based upon unchangeable unmovable irrefutable standards to understand this, I think we need to go back to the very first chapter of Revelation. For in the very first chapter of that book, John describes a picture or a vision that he has of Jesus in the very beginning of this, this uh, revelation. It's, it's found in verse 13 of chapter 1. And it helps us to understand something about the nature of Jesus. John said that he saw one standing in the midst of seven lampstands and this one had brilliant white hair and blazing eyes and feet of burnished bronze. Now what's up with all of that? The idea of the white hair signifying holiness purity, 
the blazing eyes signifying power and the feet of burnished bronze signifying judgment. But there was one other thing in that description that I want you to be sure and notice because John said, from his mouth came a double-edged sword. What is that? We'll go over to Hebrews 4 verse 12. And what does the Bible say? The word of God is, help me out church, living and active. And what? Sharper than any two-edged sword. Rightly dividing between joint and marrow, between soul and spirit. And it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Coming from the mouth of Jesus, this is the standard of judgment. Now folks, Jesus himself said in John 5, verses 28 and 29, an hour is coming in which all that are in the tomb shall hear his voice and shall come forth them that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of judgment. What's going to be the standard? It's the word of God. It's the word of God. It's not your opinion, not my opinion. It's not what brother so and so says. It's not what some Bible faculty member says. It is the Word of God. That's the standard. And I want you to notice something else. He says on that occasion another book was opened, which is the book of life. And at the end he said, whose ever name was, name was not found in the book of life was thrown into that lake of fire. I'll never forget many years ago, received a phone call at the office one day. It was from a man who wanted me to come to his town and hold a revival meeting. He said, you're a hard guy to get hold of. He said, your name's not in the book. Well, you know what he meant and so do I. My name wasn't in the phone book. Any of you remember a phone book? I don't know if we even print phone books anymore. But I'll tell you, when I was growing up in a large city, our phone book was thick. In fact, our phone book was so thick when I was a little tyke, the phone book and the Sears catalog were put on the chair to prop me up at the dining room table. As I got older, they took away the Sears catalog. And then it was just the phone book. Well, I explained to this man, I said, um, sir, I said, we live in a church-owned house, and uh, actually the phone belongs to the house, and so it's actually under the listing Church of Christ Parsonage. I had no identity in those days. But you know what, folks? My name is in a number of books. I've thought about this. My name is in a number of books. My name is in the book Preachers of Today, has been for years. My name is in the, uh, several of the Harding Lectureship books throughout the years where I've presented lectures. It's in the Lipscomb Lectures, in Crowley's Ridge Lectures, and even in the Pepperdine Lectures where I've lectured over the years. My name is in several editions of Outstanding Young Men of America. You never thought I was young, did you? And then it's at least one edition of Grumpy Old Men of America. But that doesn't mean anything to me. None of those mean a single solitary thing if my name is not in the book of life. And I don't care what accolades you may have. I don't care how much money you've got. I don't care how much fame and fortune you've got. If your name is not in that book of life, you're not ready to meet the Lord. My dear friend, I'm just putting that to you as plainly and as lovingly as I know how. But I'm concerned. The gospel does not take a vacation because of COVID. Our responsibility to God doesn't stop because of a pandemic. 
Our greatest need is still to be right with God. And I hope you'll hear me this morning. Jesus spoke about the substance of judgment. Matthew 12, he said, I tell you this, every careless word which men speak will be accounted for on the day of judgment. What? You know, when, when John said he saw the dead great and small standing before the throne and the books were opened, and notice what he says, and they were judged by what? What was in the books according to their deeds. You know that thing you did that you thought nobody knew about? Guess what? Somebody knows about it. God. You know that thing you said behind your parents' back? You thought they weren't listening and maybe they weren't and you thought they didn't hear you? Guess what? God did. It's written down. You, you, you mean everything I've done? Yes. It's in the books. It's in the books. Unless you've come to the one who is able to remove your sins as far as the east is from the west and who has blotted out every one of those transgressions and every one of those sins. That's the beauty of salvation. That when we stand at that day, when those books are opened, rather than being confronted with sin, we're being confronted with the blood of Jesus that has forgiven us of our sins so that we can hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. There's one more passage I want you to be sure and look at as you think about what Jesus said concerning the day of judgment. And that's found in Matthew 25, beginning with verse 31 through the end of the chapter. In that passage, Jesus says, there is coming an hour in which Jesus shall come with his mighty angels, be seated upon the throne, and all nations shall appear before him, and he shall separate them as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will separate the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left hand. And to the sheep he will say, Come, you blessed of my Father, enter into the joy prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was sick, and you visited me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was in prison and you came to me. And they said, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty? Or when were you a stranger that we took you in? Or when were you naked or sick or in prison? And he said, in as much as you have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, so have you done it unto me. You see, judgment's not going to be just about our personal relationship with God. Judgment's going to be concerned with how we've treated others, how we've lived our lives towards others. Others, Lord, yes, others. Let this my motto be, Lord, help me to live for others that I might live like Thee. A group of settlers 
back in pioneer days, was making their way across the prairie when suddenly in the distance they spotted the billowing smoke of a prairie fire headed towards them at a rapid pace. They began to fear for their lives. They had no way that they could go around the fire. Either way, the wind was quickly whipping it in their direction. They thought for sure that they would be burned in that prairie fire. Suddenly, one of the old timers among them took out a match, struck it, and lit the fire, or lit the grass behind them on fire. They cried out, Man, what are you doing? Now we're surrounded by fire. But they watched as the wind picked that fire up and began blowing it away from them. And after it had burned off a patch of ground, the man said, Quick! Everyone huddled together on the burned patch of ground because the fire cannot harm you where the fire has already been. On the cross, Jesus went through the fire of judgment. And when you stand with Jesus at the cross, the fire cannot harm you. Do you need to come to him? Do you need to repent and be baptized into Christ? Do you need to come back? Don't delay. For this is what Jesus said about the day of judgment. Come while we stay.